thank you for joining us for today's session. I'm your host, Debbie Mathias, with the BUILD Initiative. I'd like to begin by introducing Giovanna Archuleta, Assistant Secretary for the New Mexico Early Childhood Education and Care Department. I would like to open up this meeting acknowledging our Mother Earth and the land she nurtures us with, the land where our children grow and the land that provides the food to feed them. When we talk about these resources, we must also acknowledge the lands of our tribal people and the deep spiritual and long-standing relationship of, our, of all tribal nations. Today, I come from you from Nambe Winga, the land of my ancestors who cared for it and fought for it so that I may one day live and raise my own children on it. A relationship that predates colonial contact by thousands of years. Our ancestors still speak to us and guide us through our songs, ceremonies, and writings. Through removal, trail of tears, long walks, assimilation, and the idea that by removing children would kill a culture. Our ancestors did not give up. Our tribal people are some of the most resilient people in our country, continue, continuing to raise children to be resilient who are nurtured through language and culture, the language and culture that cannot be removed. We must also acknowledge all other spirits who were forcefully displaced from their homelands and trafficked for labor and production on sacred native land. All of us collectively continue to experience the adversity that caused our ancestors and spirits who continue to hurt from actions done to them. Take a moment to pray these people find the healing and peace to raise their children in a world that has so many opportunities, but most importantly, create coexistence free of violence. Tribal people are praying people. This is where we are all tied. Our grandmothers and mothers continue to pray over us. And as tribal people pray, they pray for people in the north, in the east, in the south, and the west. They pray for infants, children, adults and elders and our non-human relations each with knowledge to share with us as this conference begins i hope that each of you are balanced in all directions and take a moment to appreciate what mother earth has given to us and how she continues to nurture us in many ways i invite and encourage you to learn who are the original stewards of the land you live and work on and support those nations and children of those land thank you Thank you. Thank you, Giovanna. The BUILD team is excited to present this 20 webinars in 20 days for Twin 2020 series as we explore ideas, possibilities, and learn together about how we might cre recreate better, more equitable systems with children, families, and early childhood professionals at the center. We're grateful to the many individuals who took time to prepare sessions, generate content and ideas to share with us. We believe the sessions will inspire you to build on these ideas, continue conversations, and innovate back in your own communities and states. Boy, we've learned a great deal as we prepared for this virtual event. One of our lessons is that a virtual event draws a much broader audience than an in-person conference. Mm -hmm. The Build QIS conference was traditionally designed for early childhood systems leaders at the national, state, territory, tribal nation, and community levels. These individuals represent state child care administrators and continuous quality improvement leaders, state head start, pre-K, early intervention leadership, and community-based organizations such as CCRNRs, hubs, regional organizations, and others. <laughs> Also, participants have included professional development leadership, representing technical assistants, coaches, mentors, quality improvement specialists, program data collectors, and higher education faculty. Advocates, policymakers, evaluators, researchers, national TA providers, and funders have engaged at the conference in the past. 
Well, as the registration rolled in for the virtual event, we discovered many direct service providers, from teachers to center directors and home-based providers signed up for the sessions. We welcome you to our learning community and look forward to hearing your perspectives. We encourage everyone to share your comments and ideas in the chat box, but share questions in the Q&A tab so we can more clearly capture them. As you know, we had to pivot from our in-person conference to a virtual conference. We would like to say a sincere thank you to our sponsors who made that switch possible. Their support is essential to this event, and we appreciate them. Now, I'd like to turn over the session to my colleague, Sherry Killen-Stewart, to introduce our panelists and launch our sessions. Thank you so much, Debbie, um, for your hard work on improving the quality and early learning systems over the years. And um, as we know, Debbie wouldn't let this opportunity to continue to advance our practice pass by. So the need to pivot um, was something she did rapidly and then envisioned a way that we could still all be together. Um, I'm excited today to be joined by three colleagues from across the country to really um, talk about how we're responding to both the racial and economic disparities underscored by COVID and how we as leaders can build a more inclusive early care and education system. The pandemic has underscored who's advantage in the US and who is not. And many of us say we shouldn't have been surprised, but many of us have experienced some sort of hardship. We're taking care of children while we're working, if we have the privilege of working um, at home. But in the past three months, it's really laid bare the hardship that some children and families that are farthest from opportunity um, or marginalized are really experiencing. During the pandemic, we've watched childcare facilities be told they had to close or attempt to stay open. Um, we have seen people with the privilege of working at home and we've seen lots of essential workers have to continue to work while we decided whether you needed masks or, or didn't need masks or what it meant to socially distance in subways if you're in a large city and are forced to do public uh, transportation. So how can leaders build more equitable, high quality early care and education system? State and community system responses point to changes that we may want to fight to maintain. Um, we'll talk in a minute about the decisions that were made, some rapidly, usually for universal cause and not necessarily tailored to specific populations. But we've seen states and communities build the bridge the digital divide, pay attention to enrollment versus attendance, Think about telehealth and virtual home visiting. We've seen expanded utilization of home visiting. We had to rethink what it meant for foster care children to visit with their families. And we've even increased compensation for some during the crisis. So this session is designed to give an opportunity for participants to consider how we reform, transform, and revise and rebuild in ways that are sustainable, that create sustainable income, access to programs, supports that really benefit young children and families, especially those that are marginalized. And how each of you participating can use your own authority and influence to shift resources and programs to meet the health safety requirements while considering the other shortcomings we already had in our early childhood system. And you told us in your registration and we appreciated what you wanted to know about. You wanted to hear some examples and we will. You wanted to understand how the early childhood system could play a role. You wanted to have an intentional conversation about race and race equity and the disparities around COVID. You wanted to think about how cross-sector collaboration would matter. And I can't promise that in an hour we can go really deep on those topics, but I can promise you that the guests will help you be curious so that you can continue your journey 
to find answers. So I want to introduce each of them to you. And on my screen, and I'm not sure yours, um, it starts with Darnell. So I'm going to start there with Mayor Bird McPherson. Um, Darnell and I met in the Equity Leaders in Action Network that Bill ran uh, a couple of years back. She's currently serving a four-year term as mayor of Lamar, South Carolina, a small rural community that is her hometown. She was the first uh, woman of color elected to mayor in the city of Lamar, and she follows in the footsteps of her mother, who was the first woman of color elected to serve on the city council. She's also a licensed social worker in the state of uh, state of South Carolina, and her journey has allowed her to serve in multiple leadership roles over 40 years. Currently, because you may not know, but in small towns, it's not a full-time job to be mayor. Um, you have to hold down another full-time job in order to live and take care of yourself. So she's also the executive director of Darlington County First Steps to School Readiness. And she's held that position for 12 years. She's also held positions um, managing Head Start, Early Head Start for the states of South Carolina and Mississippi. Um, she really describes herself as an activist and advocate, and some of the work I know she's done is around creating access to health and health and well-being for male, males in her community. Second on my screen is uh, Felicia Dehaney, um, another friend and colleague who's currently the Director of Program and Strategy at the W.K. Kellogg Foundation in Battle Creek, Michigan. In that role, she supports the foundation's efforts to promote thriving children, working families, and equitable communities. And really, I know she sees all those issues as connected. As director of program and strategy, she leads national systems change program team that focuses on early child education, employment equity, health equity, and food systems. Felicia serves as the leader for the execution of the foundation's strategic framework in these areas, grounded in a commitment to community engagement, leadership, and racial equity. Prior to joining the foundation, she was the president and CEO of the National Black Child Development Institute in Washington, D.C., an organization whose mission it is to advance the lives of Black children and their families. Uh, she has co something in common with our uh, next speaker in that she also served as Assistant Superintendent of Early Childhood for the Office of the State Superintendent in the District of Columbia. Um, she's also, um, like many of us, I started as a nurse. Uh, Felicia started uh, as a former early childhood teacher, elementary teacher, and adjunct um, professor. And so welcome, Felicia. And then finally, we have with us Elizabeth Gurginski, who is the Secretary of Early Education in New Mexico. She has more than two decades of executive leadership and experience in public and private human service organizations at the national, state, and local levels. She previously served as Assistant Superintendent for Early Learning for the District of Columbia as well. She held that role for five years where she administered a budget of $160 million that funded programs to ensure equal access to services for a district's most vulnerable children and families. The District of Columbia was the first in 2009 to pursue universal preschool and right now has the highest participation rate of four-year-olds at 85% and three-year-olds at 75%. She previously directed the early childhood education at United Way Worldwide, where she helped a number of communities in collecting and using population-based early childhood data. She was also the former early childhood data collaborative director, which was a national coalition to improve state policies and practices for early childhood data systems. Uh, she's deep in Head Start and long-term experience she became began as a family service coordinator and later administered the county and then directed the Head Start Collaboration Office in Colorado. 
In DC, she continues to be connected to Head Start in that she oversaw one of only eight state early Head Start child care partnerships. So I think you see from the group that we are a group that not only um, talks about the work, but we come with relevant experience um, from the field. So the way we designed this session is that we are gonna have four conversations um, we're going to put some polling questions in along the way because we want your participation as well. And again, we really want you to be asking us questions or making statements, which we'll try to integrate as we go along. The four big buckets we're going to talk about is um, we're listening. Everyone on this panel is listening. And so how do we know what is the difference and what are the immediate needs of young families, the community, and the workforce when there's a crisis? You're always making choices. So how are we listening? And data, why were we surprised? We have lots of data on the well-being of Black and African American, Native American, and other communities. Um, you know, hopefully some of Elizabeth's old experience will come to bear as well. But why were we surprised that there were challenges around access to health care and food insecurity and housing? And then we'll have a discussion about solutions that matter. You know, we want to build solutions that matter. So what are we building? And what is it that we can hold on to? How do we use the momentum of this moment to really create some long-term structural change? And then finally, none of us can do this alone. This really isn't about early learning or health or mental health or parks or housing. It really, if we're addressing equity, we have to be willing to work together. So who were our local champions as we sit at the state or at the foundation or even in the local area? I know Darnell has stories about her local community coming to bear. And who are your partners at the state? And so looking forward to moving through the listening and the data, the solutions that matter, and who do we all need to be working with um, in what will be a quick hour. So everybody ready? Um, you know, use your, your, your chat to be able to talk back to us. Um, that information is not just right now information, but gives Bill ideas about other things we can do in the future and the panel's interested in what you are thinking. So ready? Okay. We are listening. How do we know what is immediate for young families, the workforce, or communities? So we're putting up a poll now um, for you to answer two questions, those of you in the audience. One is, did COVID lead you to establish more or better communications with families or providers? And two, what are you hearing from many people are across the country? We're hearing a lot about race and racism and its impact. Are you hearing messages that impacted your work? So you all answer those questions and I'll get started with the panel. So Bill really leads with this value of listening and responding to marginalized communities. Around March 12th on the East Coast, followed by multiple states across the country, every community began some form of lockdown. Um, it impacted families, communities, workforce, and business. Everybody was told to stay home. Programs and services had to rethink their delivery. And in most cases, individuals providing programs and services actually couldn't be contacted. If you weren't in a program already, you were actually lost to the communication cycle if you weren't connected. So in this context, how did you all create a two-way conversation? How did you ensure that families, caregivers, the workforce were hearing key messages because the government was pushing out a lot? And I don't know about you, but I have young kids that don't have television anymore. So they're not looking at television in the national news. And so I know for some of the providers in my area, just making sure that they were getting accurate information as things change mm -hmm. day by day mm -hmm. was in and of itself a challenge. Mm -hmm. And then how did what you heard back from communities impact your actions? And finally, um, how do you sustain the process of listening? Because many communities are excited they're being listened to for the first time, but how do you sustain that kind of listening going forward? So mm -hmm. who wants to kick it off? Uh, 
<laughs> Darnell, you want to go, Darnell, or? Go ahead. Darnell. Okay. So I, I think the first assignment was to tell us a little bit about why we're in this work and what's really happened with us. Uh, in my role as a mayor of a small community, we I've been trying to get um, some COVID testing for our community. We, we are served by a federally qualified health center, but it's taken me almost three months to get the needle moved. It turns out that this particularly federally qualified health center decided that the federal dollars that they received, they were going to use to upgrade their laboratory. So the federally qualified center in our neighboring community said, okay, if it's okay, we'll come and uh, offer these services to your community. So as of yesterday, we're actually, we have scheduled COVID testing for the 17th of July for our community. Now, mind you, when, when we talk about a small rural community, we, have, um, we don't have access, we don't have transportation to, to doctors. We are uh, limited in terms of our resources and we are over 75% of our community consists of people who are elderly. And so it's been very challenging working in the community, knowing that there was this great need for this particular population and trying to get it accessed. And just as of yesterday, it's another quick example. The Council on Aging provides food every day, uh, baskets of food, uh, boxes of food uh, to, uh, to elderly families. Well, yesterday it rained, so they didn't give out the boxes. And I thought, what? It rained? And you <laughs> some people are not supposed to eat. So, you know, there are lots of, um, of those kind of instances. I think that sometimes when people are looking at communities, they look at the data, but they don't see the human face behind it. Yeah, thank you so much, Darnell. And thanks for getting me back <laughs> on track. Elizabeth or Felicia, do you have a story that comes to mm -hmm. mind, keeps you up at night in this work mm -hmm. right now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and then let uh, Felicia add on to that. Thank you. And I just want to give a special thank you to Assistant Secretary uh, Giovanna Archuleta, um, our Assistant Secretary for Native American Early Education and Care, uh, the department uh, that launched last Wednesday, July 1, here in New Mexico. We now join Massachusetts, Georgia, Alabama, and that's it. <laughs> uh, and us as the four states with a, a, a state-level early childhood education and care department. Uh, just to be clear, we're everything, we're a prenatal to five department and uh, the work that Assistant Secretary Archuleta has done in her very short time has already brought a really great focus um, around the equity issue here in New Mexico. We have 19 Pueblos, uh, two Apache tribes and the Navajo Nation. And many of you have seen nationally uh, the impact um, to the Navajo Nation in particular, over half of the deaths in the state of New Mexico are in our tribal community in the Navajo Nation in particular, but other of our Pueblos have been uh, definitely heavily impacted. And uh, because they are other communities, they are multi-generational, uh, they're living together, the impact has just been for so profound for so many families, the, the loss and, of life um, and family. So, uh, the things that do keep us up are, are really just this issue around, I think, the listening that you talked about, Sherry, and a story that in the early days, in, you know, March 13th and March 16th uh, comes to mind. Uh, we didn't, you know, none of us knew everything was changing. We were getting new information every day. And so my immediate inclination just from my work over the years was we have to have some way to communicate constantly with the community like so we have our home visiting programs our child care programs our pre-k programs and so we set up daily calls uh, briefings every morning eight to nine uh, and we just we had a spanish line and we have spanish huge parts of our state are spanish speaking only so uh, we just went into action to just whatever we knew we were sharing with the community because what we knew every day was changing and we all know that knowledge and information is power. It allows you to take action uh, and do things that you need to do for your family. And then the other thing that we did when I saw some people in the chat box commenting too is, you know, the early days where the supply chains were broken and people didn't have things, uh, but yet we knew we needed not only food, but we needed sanitation materials. We needed all these things. We also did a provider survey, just what supplies do you need? Not so much that we were going to provide them for them. We would if we had to, but we just needed to understand, like, what do you need? And out of both of those actions, we started just building this real sense of community across the state. 
uh, between, you know, home visiting providers and early intervention providers, childcare providers, everybody were on these calls. We were a state that chose to keep child, we, we allowed childcare to decide whether they were going to close or remain open. And so we had about half of our licensed facilities close pretty immediately and just say that, you know, due to staff and other issues, they couldn't stay open. Um, but we did have others. So those were some of the things that just come to mind immediately was yeah. keeping the communication two way. We had the chat like here. So people would put ideas in there and what about this? And you could just see like the anxiety, um, the fear uh, was, it, it helped. It helped calm just at least to know every morning we would all be together and we could have a conversation about what we learned in the last 24 hours. Um, so that's something I just right. want to share. In but, but even when you didn't have all the answers, you, correct. you had the calls. Felicia, um, either a story that gets you going and, <clears throat> and how are you listening? So um, I think one of the stories that is that we um, elevated, not only at work, but it was a key reminder that we are part of these communities, that what was happening that impacted our partners and our grantees were also impacting um, the privilege of the walls of Kellogg, our own staff, um, our contractors. Um, so the conversation was um, more authentic and shifted to really embrace the fact that, like, how are we not only listening to our grantees and our partners, but listening to each other and ensuring to really, you know, someone said, you know, the crack in the system. No, we really believe that these were man-made racial and economic mm -hmm. holes that existed for a very long time. And... So really hearing from our grantees and the stories um, really shifted internal the dialogue at Kellogg on how we help and how we position ourselves to help, but not moving into action without the guidance of our partners, right? Because we quickly, even on our own team, realized that our needs look so different. So there wasn't a one way approach that we really had to individually listen to our partners and, our, and the members of our team to make sure the work continues collectively. I think one story that um, was definitely lifted in my mind was um, a colleague, we have an office in Mexico, Kellogg um, has an office in uh, Mexico City, and um, she said that when she was going to do a visit very early in the beginning of the pandemic when it got to uh, Mexico, and she was talking to some of our grantees that were in the Yucatan Peninsula, you know, rural areas, and they were trying to gauge the impact of how the virus um, was having on their community. One of the men in the community said, you know, it's, it's the same for us. This is how we've been living, without water, without clean water. Like, you know, we die yearly of malaria. We die yearly. I mean, these things that have been exacerbated but we're the norm for so many communities that we've been working with and living with. So it's really, you know, looking deeper at the core root systemic changes that have to be made in the moment and when we think about building forward. So I think that is really critical for us to keep front of mind, like thinking big, but understanding that this didn't start with COVID, right? This is, these, this is real life for so many of our communities. Right. No, that's so powerful. And so looking at the results, we can share them. Um, it really demonstrates that 85% of people say yes, they started to listen or have stronger relationships. 15% um, said no. And then um, we're hearing across the country about racism and its impacts and hearing those messages. And 13% said it's still not impacting their work. 87% says that it is. And so really encourage those that, um, that maybe aren't in the listening space yet to create a partner. Uh, Cause you know, a lot of folks don't listen because we can't feel responsible for everything that we hear, but we can go out and listen in partnership with others. I think Elizabeth, you demonstrated that you were listening, you didn't have all the answers, but you were mm -hmm. holding on. And, and Felicia, your story about starting first with the staff, you know, we're always talking about let's diversify the staff, and we diversify the staff. But if you don't give voice to that staff and you don't have a way to include that, it's really tokenism. In fact, people um, more fall into the mold. 
So thank you both for sharing that. One question that came out, and I know Elizabeth, you um, were challenged by this, is how are you working to ensure marginalized communities were in those daily calls? Um, because yeah. you talked to me about rural communities, and I know Darnell, it's an issue for you in your small town. There's some people who don't have internet or the Zoom right. number or whatever to be yeah. able to work in this way. So how did you, what did you have yeah. to do to make sure they were included? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that follow-up question. And I, um, I, much of it was having to use the word of mouth, the informal networks to get to those individuals. We did work somewhat through our food meal sites to get information written to be handed out to families. It's an area we still need to focus on. We have a large number of registered homes across the state, over 1,500. And about two, you know, month and a half, two months in, there was an opportunity to talk to some of them and they, they were not looped in to the communication. And so we had to really think about what is it about how we're doing our outreach. And we brought in our food sponsors because they work closely with them. So we're trying to think of who are the people that they have connection with. I think we have a lot of room for growth in this area still of thinking about, you know, is it using pediatricians? Is it using um, our faith community, using them as important allies in reaching people with the information? Because it was critical in the early, and it still continues to be critical that people are connected to information that can help them save their business, uh, protect their families, protect their, um, their livelihood. So we were able to do some of that. And then again, working with our home visiting programs and our early intervention programs that we're doing the telehealth and connecting, being able to share with families who could share with other families and with our tribal uh, leaders and tribal communities. Um, Assistant Secretary Archuleta uh, does a great job. Uh, one thing we re realized right away is a lot of the food programs started at the age of one. And so she worked really closely both with our WIC partners and the tribal and non-tribal, but to set up getting baby food um, formula yeah. and those first six months of baby food. So things like that, that we know are oftentimes forgotten about our littlest ones, our babies. Right. Uh, and so that was a great opportunity. And our home visiting programs helped deliver that. So we set up this kind of robust network of community providers through those calls. And people said, I'll raise my hand. I want to be part of helping. Uh, and so we hope to continue building on that community a coalition and community building, you know, post post pandemic. And Felicia, we got another question. It said, you know, some people um, people feel don't have a right to service. Thinking about our immigrant population, our undocumented population. How does the foundation think about that in its work? Um, mm -hmm. Because when you start out with that bias frame that you don't have a right to service, what do you do in these times? Right. Well, we have amazing grantees that um, do work in um, immigrant uh, population, with immigrant populations. Um, it is at the core of our work, um, marginalized communities, undocumented communities. We partner closely with states, with Head Start. You know, it is this, that's exactly, you know, some of the deeper conversations that I think we need to have. I was sharing with a colleague of mine when we were talking about our farm to school work, right? And the farmers and the devastation that this had many of our communities. And um, during this time, we've, we've been doing a lot of Zoom call. And I said to them, as they were talking about migrant workers, and I said, I'm a granddaughter of a migrant worker. You know, I am a daughter of undocumented uh, parents who, due to the birth of my older sister in the 60s, were able to now stay in America, and I'm the product of that. Mm -hmm. So as we talk about that and we recognize, like, the impact that it has, not only on the here and now, but moving forward in the future and the possibilities, and who are these trusted navigators in our system to reach those populations? Mm -hmm. Who were all those trusted voices and messengers to ensure that those communities that have a right not to trust us, not to trust the typical messengers, not to trust the typical system. Mm -hmm. And we have some amazing grantees that are doing that work, some of our national grantees. Of course, Elizabeth and I not only um, shared the same position at one time, but we partnered closely with our work there in Albuquerque and our office and our team 
in New Mexico. And it, I would really say those on authentic conversations, the folks that you trust to do the work mm-hmm. and the, 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 the communication that you, the translation of the communication and the messages that you get from these marginalized communities, folks say communities at risk. I, I, I like to say the communities that we placed at risk mm-hmm. for these situations. How do we hear from them and how do we partner with them to ensure that what they really are asking for is what we really hear that they need and respect what they're asking for, respect the support they need. And um, those are, those are tough conversations, but not impossible. Right. So I I think, you know, it's, it's those things that we have to dive deeper into. Yeah. We're going to wrap this. Yeah, definitely. We're going to wrap the section in two sections, but I was going to go to you, Darnell, um, but just want to put the pin, Felicia, in this idea of trust, because we don't trust our families and we don't trust non-normal, non-traditional providers. And you spoke exactly. about that statement, and you must trust. Darnell? That's exactly what I wanted to talk about, is the, the importance of relationships. Because even as you were talking, Felicia, you related, you went back to relationships, your relationship with Elizabeth, other relationships. And on this journey, that's the most important part of what we do, because it's not what we know, it's who we know. In our community, we have a, there are four, two large cities. One of them is Hartsville, which has a Fortune 500 company. And there's a foundation base there. So they have weekly calls with providers, and it's just listening and talking about you know, what's going on, what do we need to do, how can we help each other. But then in our, um, one of our foundations reached out to us, the Duke Endowment, we received some funds from them previously, and they were asking these same questions, what can we do to help these marginalized communities, what are you all doing, how can we support you? So the, but had we not had relationships with any of those people, we would have been left out of the conversation. And one of the things I've also found as a small grantee funded by the state primarily, is that sometimes we have to do things without any money. So, so they didn't give you money to buy iPads or they didn't give you money to do this. Well, you have to find a way to do what has to be done. I'll say this one little thing about, about my faith. There's a gospel song that says, I do not want my living to be in vain. And I believe that when we're in whatever the position we're placed in, we're placed in for the time that is now. So I am so committed and so glad to be a part of this and meeting all of y'all and learning about what else is going on in the United States. Thank you. No, thank you so much, Darnell, for for placing it right um, back in the community. So we're going to move now to our data section. Um, You know, back to, you know, why were we surprised? Um, I know the folks on the, on the, screen are not necessarily surprised, but we have lots of data on communities, their well-being. Um, there's a great survey uh, study being done right now called the EC Rapid Impact of Pandemic Development on Early Childhood um, by the University of Oregon. And it's finding that material well-being for African Americans or Blacks, regardless of income, is going down and stress is going down. And so we want to often have a conversation about poverty. It's not just poverty. It is some of the structural things in play. Um, Put up the polling question. Um, I want to just say that, you know, answer this question, audience. Um, Prior to the health academic, were you aware that Black, Latino, Native American communities had differential access to quality health care and early learning experiences? Um, because both quantitative, we got a lot of numbers, and the qualitative stories that you heard the panelists share are important and key to understanding the reality. You know, being in your community, Darnell, like you said, on the ground is a very different experience because you didn't say that when you got that testing, you didn't get it from your local federal qualified healthcare center. You did get it based on a relationship outside. So local does matter. But we've long had data about the well-being of caregivers. We know our early childhood workforce is underpaid. That's why it was easy in COVID to add salary and compensation. We've got multiple indexes and databases that tell us that story. And we've had it for a long time about the lack of access to healthcare or early learning, employment, housing, quality food. 
But despite that, the country seems to be surprised. Um, and now we've got a whole generation of young people out here letting us know that we can no longer continue to do this across racial bounds. So how do you each understand the national reaction, the being surprised? More importantly, what will it take for us to stop ignoring the data and start responding through our policies, our programs, and our strategies. You know, I'm not one that tolerates we don't have the money. And a lot of right. states right now are hearing we're going to have a 5% or we're going to have a 20% cut. And for some, that means retrenching. But it's a time to actually lean into this opportunity and really do more. So as how do we move away from just having universal responses to really having tailored responses that meet the needs of marginalized um, mm -hmm. communities. So who, who wants to start? <laughs> Great question. Uh, Mayor, do you wanna? Well, I, I just think the first thing we have to realize is the data represents real individuals. Mm -hmm. You know, I think sometimes people are looking at numbers and they don't equate that to, uh, to individuals, to to that family that you may not know, but it's a family. Mm -hmm. These are people who need mm -hmm. services. These are children who are not do not have access to um, quality care. These are wage earners that are, don't have a livable wage. I think that we need to get out of the ivory tower and get in the trenches. But the main thing we need to do is V-O-T-E. <laughs> exactly. If we're going to make a change, exactly. we've got the right. V-O-T-E. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Thank you. I would agree. And I would say that, um, you know, we're fortunate in New Mexico to have an incredible leader like Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham, who, you know, from the get go was like, whatever it takes, whatever the residents of New Mexico need, um, we're going to do. And, you know, we, we've heard the stories, you know, the Navajo Nation, there's whole parts of it that have do not have access to running water. You know, the early days was like, wash your hands, wash your hands. And mm -hmm. so there was just a huge um, emphasis of our National Guard and everybody being deployed to make sure that we were able to get water and all the supplies um, to our tribal communities. But again, it's this this lack of federal investment that has led to this um, condition and these situations and being putting people at risk, as Felicia said, and not communities at risk that include the Indian health services that was, you know, what, what way too underfunded and uh, not able to deploy the resources. But again, we've been just working as one state, we could all together, New Mexico and pulling the resources, but it, it did, I think the pandemic exposed all the inequities, the structural inequities, the, the individual uh, and the racial. And, um, and so we, we've been, so it's been interesting to see like all this flexibility that we've been afforded as a state and different states to, you know, uh, charge, you know, use telehealth, you know, in-person visits, but the telehealth, you know, all, all these things that have actually helped, you know, kind of helped plug, but the, the cracks, the gaps were already so large. Um, and so I think it's, we want to use this opportunity to not go back and to not, uh, we need to address the structural inequities, the racial uh, and the historic inequities um, going forward, because this is this is the opportunity. I mean, to, to to use something this pandemic to hopefully finally invest where we need to invest, and to do it in a way that actually meets the needs of the families and the the children across the state by listening to families. I think that's what we want to do, and that's something that we're starting to work with the schools on their reopening strategy is the hybrid models. How do we listen and hear from families what all of their needs are, not just how do I help my child learn during virtual, but what are the other things that are really impacting their access to health care, their access to uh, food, their access to jobs. Um, so I think being um, mindful of that and making sure the data that we collect from families gives us a robust understanding and picture to drive better strategy. Yeah, thank that. you. Felicia? So I, I agree with the data and, and building a stronger system that aligns um, just the cultural practices within communities of how that data is used and how that data informs funding, how that data informs policy, and how we don't use that data, well, we use that data in transparency, right? We want to do no harm, but how do we make it transparent? 
and hold folks accountable. I definitely will support the voting. Uh, I work for the Kellogg Foundation. We are nonprofit. <laughs> but, you know, th- th- those things matter, especially at the local level, at the district level. It's informed. And move away from using data that is st- statistically significant to justify sufficient. We have to be careful of that because we'll see that there is an increase or statistically significant increase here, there, but that's not sufficient when you look at the data and the numbers that are not new. This is not brand new. We can go back for years, whether it's economic, poverty, race, these have existed. So how do we shift that transparency, hold accountable that transparency, and do movement change that I do believe is grounded in those voices in the communities, in the, 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 both at the um, national level, but at the state level of how we vote, how we build leadership, who are those voices, how does change occur within these communities? Mm-hmm. And we have to pay attention to that. There's a movement happening a right now movement. <laughs> and I think it's critically important that we, we jump on that, we address that, and we, and, and, we, and, we, and we ground ourselves in it, right? So it's not just a moment now, and we talk about it 10 years ago, that we're building on this um, to, to, to just ground it in just who we are as a community, who we are as a nation, and how we see not only our youngest residents, but just all of us in this circle of accountability. No, that's great. And we got a question in from Rich that said, you know, thinking about the early care and education group, that many of them see themselves as individual entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And so what are your thoughts about how we can improve relationships across them so that they can work together towards the local and state economic development and response Mm -hmm. to crises, you know, specifically COVID, but others. And when you're thinking about the data, you talked about transparency, um, Felicia, you talked, Elizabeth, about knowing all along, Mm -hmm. you know, how do we use the field that we're in to bring them together to use the data to make the change we need to see? We need to organize. I was going to, (laughs) yeah. Good. (laughs) We need to organize. We, we, there's so much power in our group, but we're not organized. Um, mm-hmm. So if we have, we have the, well, first of all, we have to have the right message. Mm-hmm. And we have to know that this represents money. Right. But, but we have to show that we have power. So that means we have to forget about, the, um, you know, our board won't allow us to do this. So we can't be a part of that group or whatever, it, whatever mm-hmm. those barriers are. We need mm-hmm. to break down the barriers and have mm-hmm. everyone come together so that we can move forward for mm-hmm. early learning. Um, in our state, there's a lot of emphasis on 4K, but the state legislature mm-hmm. put a lot of money in 4K. Well, children don't start learning at 4K, they learn in the mm-hmm. womb. So, you know, so that's right. supposed to satisfy us. Another issue, that, and I'll get off my horse in just a minute, <laughs> is that our state funding for our local community is based on the number of children that we serve under the age of five based on the population. Well, our population of children under five was decreased, went down. So what did they do? They cut our funding. And I'm saying that makes no sense. If anything, Mm -hmm. it's a little bit of money you're giving us. Why not allow us to keep those few dollars so that we can improve the quality? So it's, it's like even those people who are in the leadership, top level leadership roles, they need, this is an awakening. This, this pandemic is an awakening. And I think mm-hmm. that all of us, whether they're at the state level or the national level, everybody's open, their eyes are open. Now, some people don't want to see, but others see. And there are going to, and the ch- system changes are being made. They're small, mm-hmm. but they're going to increase. They're going to increase. Mm-hmm. Right, quite powerful. Love the concrete example of investing in fours when we know that the brain development, really prenatal, you uh, you began your work with me thinking about male health, but preconception health is important when we talk about infant mortality and infants Mm -hmm. being born um, early. Um, Your idea about organizing is a great way to transition, especially Mm -hmm. when you talk about transparency. So if you take the transparency of the data, you can organize around it and then have a message, you know, to be clear that the decisions you may be making at the state are not ones that actually benefit. Because honestly, you should be investing more in your community if you understood it based on all the data indicators and no opportunity to remove, um, remove resources in these times. 
Um, mm -hmm. So um, let's look at the poll real quick. So 90% okay. of folks um, were aware of the data. So I would challenge you to say, if you knew, then what example can you come up with about what you did with knowing? Um, and then 10% no. So everybody get one, teach one. Um, you know, it's not enough. You don't even understand data by looking at it from your own lens because you bring your own biases, your own knowledge, your own experience. Much better mm -hmm. to look at data with a colleague or a partner, especially looking at it from a different um, angle. And so I encourage the 10% of you that were not aware to connect with someone who may know about the data or both of you get on the Google and look it up. I mean, that's the other thing about this time is that data is readily available um, if you seek it. But thank you all for also um, participating in the poll. So we're going to mm -hmm. shift gears again, and we're going to move into building solutions that matter. Um, all of you, um, and you've already started, Darnell, like, give us some example, have done things. Using your professional role, COVID mm -hmm. happened. Um, you know, I was able with the support of a different foundation to take some money where we were having a meeting and invest that directly in community. But all of us sit with a certain level of influence, mm -hmm. power, and authority. So what action did you take in your professional role in response to COVID? What did policy or practice, Felicia, you talked about flexibility. What did you um, make flexible? Um, so we witness states and the federal government really make rapid decisions um, to benefit some. Decisions about child care, whether it was on or off, or a small classroom or large classroom, um, pay rates, um, some states got out PPE. Um, unemployment came rapidly in a shared mm -hmm. decision. We hadn't gotten a vote in months prior, prior to that. Um, all, most of these decisions didn't benefit marginalized communities. I mean, you think about the tax um, stimulus, it may not have gotten, it certainly didn't get to immigrant or non-documented um, families. Many of the communities, Darnell already gave us the example, were the last to get the testing. I mean, she talked about July on something that happened in March. In fact, where they initially put stations were not in minority communities um, for testing. Many of them would drive up. And so if you walked, you weren't able to, in the early days, get testing. Um, and we paid a lot of attention. Um, and I started my career as a nurse. I'm still a nurse to essential workers and healthcare workers. But I don't think we paid attention to all essential workers. We really mm -hmm. had a lean in to healthcare workers. And not that it wasn't earned, but it wasn't the entire story. So why do you think we were able to make different decisions during COVID? And what lessons can we learn about how the decision-making process worked that we can hold on to and, and move into the future of making decisions? And then what are any policies or practices that you actually were able to take up and do during COVID that you might not have been able to do before and who benefited? from that. Um, and all of this speaks to our hope that we can sustain some of the good decisions. Um, things about additional compensation for the workforce or materials going in to child care. So anything you have to say about that and especially marginalized mm -hmm. communities is of interest. Mm -hmm. And why don't we put up the poll, um, but you all can start talking. Okay. So one of, well, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead, Felicia. Go. <laughs> go ahead. You start this sure. time. <laughs> so um, one of the things that we immediately did at the foundation was to um, release our requirements for the current grant agreements with our grantees. I think it was critically important to ensure that um, during this time, um, you know, the, that program deliverable was just not going to happen. And usually those of you who have grant funds, you have to write a justification of why you want to do a budget shift or have, you know, we waived all justification. We allowed our grantees to shift funding to um, either shift it to general op or shift it to um, the work that they had to do immediately in the community, which was a lift. And I, and I could hear it when we were having the conversations even when we said, go ahead and make the shift, they were like, okay, well, what form do we have to fill out? And we were like, no <laughs> form, <laughs> just do it. And it was just, I mean, like some of them were like, really, we can just, just do it. And I think 
there was a sense of, um, you know, relief. But at the same time, again, when we talked about the relationships with our grantees, we trusted them, right? Like, we know the power that we have. We know the privilege we have at the foundation. And we were, we were, we really felt good about just releasing all of that and giving that total power and that total privilege to our grantees who are on the ground, who know the work best, who know the community best, and allow them to make those decisions and trust them around making those decisions. Um, pushing back reporting deadlines, pushing all of those things that, you know, they, they are things that sometimes folks will say, well, that's kind of like a privileged response, but to our grantees was so meaningful. Like they could just shift and not think about Kellogg. And we said that on some of the calls, like don't think about us, do the work, keep your family safe, keep yourself safe and do what we need to do to keep our um, community safe. Mm -hmm. So we were really happy that our president and CEO immediately said, make it happen. We didn't have to go through internal approval. <laughs> she said, make it happen. Actually, mm -hmm. she said, make it happen now. So we were very <laughs> clear on the, the instructions um, with her and we were free to just, you know, work with our grantees during this time. So that was a huge shift internally for us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you, Felicia. Yeah. Elizabeth? Yeah, I think um, similarly, again, I, I mean, have to credit our governor who said child care is essential and um, we need to support our, our early childhood professionals. So we were able to quickly um, waive, you know, things like extend families contracts. They didn't have to worry about coming in person. And we were able to do some of those immediate things that relieved those pressures we waived all parent co-pays uh, for three months just so that take that pressure off of them, take, make sure that the programs were still receiving funding and extended um, and paid all contracts that were in place in March all the way through June, whether the facility was open or closed, whether the parent was attending or not. Um, and those were important things that we did. And then we used the federal dollars that we received to do bonus wage incentive uh, for early childhood professionals who continued to work and serve our families and young children. I would say the other thing that the governor did is she said, if any early childhood professional doing their work, serving our families and young children does get COVID uh, and does not have access to health insurance, the state will cover that and will cover it for any family member who does through their recovery. So, you know, knock on wood so far, um, we've been doing intensive surveillance. We've surveilled um, through testing almost 80% of our early childhood workforce. Uh, that are operating and uh, so far good news. I mean, the people have insurance, but we also have our family's first program, which is a nurse case management that's part of our new department that mm -hmm. is reaching out to every person who ha does test positive, reaching out to that facility director or owner and just offering support. Do the staff, do, do people have insurance? Do they have housing? Do they have food support? So mm -hmm. I, I think it, you know, I want to really echo the mayor and, and Felicia's comments about the relationships is is really what we want to, that, that's the solution is building those stronger relationships. And similarly with, um, I think it was Rich's question about economic development. I mean, we brought our economic development partners to the table in those calls with providers. We started regional meetings with our um, early childhood child care resource and referral uh, supports with our regional economic development teams, um, really highlighting the, the need that all states have to enhance the business practices for their early childhood. So I think um, it is about the relationships. And I would just say those are some of the things that uh, we did immediately. Uh, and now we're going to release uh, next week child care stabilization recovery grants, again, using the federal money to all licensed providers, uh, regardless of uh, whether they're open or closed. We just know that more money is needed to, to stabilize our industry. Um, mm -hmm. But knowing that we have to build from this and what can we learn? So, you know, through the application process, mm -hmm. both for the bonus wage incentive for employees and through the, we're, we're asking questions so that we can become more knowledgeable about the strengths um, and the needs and the challenges of our industry here in New Mexico. Right. Uh, Darnell? We actually began to maximize the use of technology. So two mm -hmm. things. In our small community, before I became mayor, we did not have a website. <laughs> we did not have a newsletter. <laughs> so we, we, have a, we have a website so people can go in, ask questions. We can talk to people, find out what's going on. Um, and in terms of our organization, 
we already have people who were working from homes and I got this from the build experience. <laughs> you don't have to be in a physical office to do your work. <laughs> so, and of course I caught some flack for that. Why well, do you have these people working from home and how do you hold them accountable and da 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 da. But when the word mm. came in March and we had to flip over, we were already ready because people had, you know, laptops, uh, uh, printers, everything they needed at home, iPhones, et cetera, et cetera. So we did not miss a beat in that regard. Mm -hmm. And in terms of our work with parents, we have what we have parent support groups. We have the, uh, home visitation programs. So we already had the closed Facebook page. We already were doing FaceTime. So we increased some of those things. And then we found out, well, what is it that you really need? So we created these care packages for families with hand sanitizer mm -hmm. and disinfectant and games for children and on it, you know, just trying to make sure that people had things. And mm -hmm. if you go to our website for Darwin County First Steps, not only can you refer people to us for services, but if you're someone in the community that needs a resource, then you can fill out a form there and say, oh, this is what I really need. Now, we may not have it, but we may find it at the United Way. So we then become the conduit. We're trying to become the conduit for anybody in the community that says, this is something I need. I need diapers. We always have diapers. Mm -hmm. that sort of thing. But a resource so that if people need something, they can come to our website and we can connect them to others in the community. So we're really using, uh, trying to maximize our technology. And I wanna give a shout out to one of our partners in the upstate. I'm in what's called the PD area near the beach. And uh, one of our partners in the upstate in the Greenville area was able to get a, a grant to provide funds to home care providers. Each home care provider, they you know, could fill out a little form and they could immediately get $1,000, Felicia, no questions asked. This is what you need. We're going to help you with that. This, this organization, this provider had also set up what they call Palmetto Shared Services. So uh, uh, daycare homes, um, daycares could buy into this organization and buy things in bulk, but they could also get legal services, HR services, all of those things. And so he called me from Greenville. He said, Darnell, I've got this money. I know the PD area. You all don't have anything. I said, that's right. So then we, there were like, of the 12 home care providers that we have operating in our community, seven of them took advantage of this, were able to get funds. But it goes back to relationships, making mm -hmm. sure that people know that their needs, and then being open to helping people, regardless of whether they fit into your criteria or not. It doesn't matter if you don't have a child that's under the age of five, but you have a need, you can go to our website. We'll try to help you get connected to someone else. So I think, again, it's, is uh, again, thinking outside of the box, working with your funders, uh, trying to get the word out that we can we can do this, but it's gonna take some, people have to be flexible. Again, Felicia, I, my hat's off to the Kellogg Foundation. You know, you have to build in some flexibility. Yeah. The services yeah. need to be provided. One, one of the questions that is in the box, um, and I'm gonna throw it in here, because I think it's about solutions, is that lots of early childhood and care programs have put out statements around Black Lives Matter, around police brutality, mm -hmm. but a lot of their leadership is pushing back or their membership, people in their audience and saying, stay in your lane. What is you all's response to that, that, that for police brutality and community conditions outside of the relationship around early education and care is not appropriate? What do you all say to that? Mm -hmm. My standard answer, uh, Jerry, because I got the same question when we started uh, working in the area of men's health. And now uh, the South Carolina Cancer Alliance has published a 20-year trends report showing that men of color die from all types of cancers at higher rates than any other, uh, any other gender. I'm saying that these are families that we're talking about. Families are part of communities. If exactly. it impacts a family, whether it's the father, the mother, the child, then it's our responsibility. I go back again to this point of if we are placed in this position and it is not, you know, sometimes people don't understand. And yes, they put up roadblocks, but the, the, road, the roadblocks become a stepping stone. We just have to move forward and say, okay, this is, we have to look at this as a family. Families make communities. And if our yeah. communities are going to be strong, then we have to have strong families. Yeah. Thank you. Elizabeth, here's one for you or Felicia, because you both have this experience. But how are you handling or thinking about the tension between federal rights and state rights? And how does it compound the problem of really creating equitable solutions at the community level? 
I mean, for us, we're, you know, very, I mean, we're very connected to our, um, all of our tribal, I mean, very connected. We know that we have a lot of work to do as a new department and as a state to build stronger government to government relationships and build that trust. So much work has to be done there. But I think we feel strongly that our, I mean, as, as Assistant Secretary Archulette often says, like, it's our children is where we're going to heal. Like, this, this is where the impact continues to be repeated and begins so early that if we don't see the, I mean, we'll be missing a lot of opportunities for really important solutions if we don't see the connection point between the protests and the racial justice movement happening right now and the work that we're doing in early childhood. Um, to the mayor's point, children live in families, families live in communities. When those communities are full of racial uh, tension and racism, um, those families are impacted, then their children are impacted. So we're, we're going to do a lot. We're talking, I'm um, actually this week thinking about how to create equity councils around the state, um, thinking what would that possibly look like. We're just in a brainstorming mode, but many states have early childhood councils or other things, but what would it look like if we replicated more, uh, not replicated, but created equity councils that had a focus mm -hmm. on the needs of families um, and young children, uh, mm -hmm. because if the families don't have jobs or they're food insecure or other, or they don't have access to health care, mm -hmm. the work that we're doing in early childhood is not going to be able to have the kind of impact that we know it can have when those early experiences are so uh, full of trauma and, again, the, the historical uh, racism and also the current um, experiences that our families are facing every day in their communities. Yeah. Alicia, would you add anything? Um, sure. I was, th I was uh, thinking if I should respond as Felicia from Kellogg or Felicia. Um, so, just just so let us it's, know what hat you're wearing. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's interesting when folks say stay in your lane. I don't know what lane you're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. It is, first of all, this is a lane that um, many folks, um, when, when a child is born, they don't choose their lane, right? Like they don't say, you know, I'm black with this color. Um, so this is the, the back lane that I'm trying. So I, I, I don't, I, 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 I str struggle sometimes probably being professionally appropriate answering those kind of questions because it's offensive to me as a black woman, a mother of a black son, a wife to a black husband. And, you know, when you talk, when you talk about not having that voice, just a quick story. I moved to Florida a couple years ago, oh, a couple years ago, not even a year ago. And um, to be closer to my parents, who have, um, my dad has dementia. And we think sometimes about the privileged places. I have health insurance. We have health insurance. We have coverage. We live in a great community. And um, with his dementia, he gets erratic sometimes and emotional outbursts. And my mother had to call the um, ambulance, uh, the police, the other day just to help her out, to bring him to the doctor. And I asked my husband to go, my parents live seven houses down from me, go down and help my mother out. And my husband said to me, um, I don't think I should go. I think that it's better that the police come and see your mother, when my mother is white, because they might give your dad better care and react differently to your dad seeing your mother there. So... My response is check the privilege that you have in the seat that you sit in because it might not be the privileged seat you might be sitting in tomorrow, right? So responding to this stay in your lane, like that that's not a lane. I mean, as a black woman, I know my lane, but that's not even something I would even consider, right, mm -hmm. in, in my privileged position. But it's, it's part of the world we live in. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not a choice. Mm -hmm. So there is no lane. You know, it is uh, the accountability for each of us as part of this community, as part of the community members, mm -hmm. to make sure we're all in the right lane. That's, right. that's what I would say. Thank you. And I heard somebody say a quote around equity the other week, that equity is really a multi-lane highway, you know, and it's got mm -hmm. multi-lane policies around housing and food and right. security and access to tax Health. base and education and zoning yeah, all of that exactly. is part of the lane and it impacts all of us yes exactly right, right. 
Okay. None of in the chat, I mean, in the chat box, people are pointing out a lot of this, you know, this starts so early with the expulsions and the disproportionate expulsion of African-American with boys. Kids, and, absolutely. Yeah, it's a, like and these are policies that we know, right? Yes. So when we talk right. about the data, I love data and I love research. But um, I will tell you that it exhausts me when we know the data. <laughs> we know what's exactly. happening. This is not new. This is something that my 46-year-old self studied at Howard University at 18. Like, right. this is like, when, you know, this is not new. It is an accountability for a movement that now needs to make change happen. Correct. Right. Starting so early. moving to our next bucket, it's, you know, uh, no system or person can really do this alone, um, really require systemic responses and local champions. And I know all of you have worked with others in order to really be able to do this work and, and lean into this work. So how did you get to the local champions? I think we have one more polling question. Um, primarily 96% of you said you had modified your policy and practice um, on, the last, um, on the last question. But mm -hmm. this idea that we got two more polling questions around the system, which we can put up now. Um, one is, you know, as a part of COVID response, are you working differently or forming new partnerships outside of your agency. This builds right onto our multi-lane highway conversation. Mm -hmm. right. And do you think you'll be able to sustain these partnerships and build more systemic responses? Darnell keeps bringing us back to, and others, listening to the family and what they say we've got to trust and that's the need we've got to fulfill. Sometimes we start with our own values and try to give people um, what we want versus giving them what they say they need to have their family work. So early childhood systems is complex, equity is complex and filled with intersectionalities and you really need partners across health, early learning, education, economic, nutrition, mm -hmm. housing. Um, Felicia, your job demonstrates that all of those things matter at the same time. So what is your relationship to different aspects of the challenges and solution? <clears throat> and how are you staying connected? Um, Elizabeth, you mentioned the business community and yeah. um, early learning and small business. Mm -hmm. And we know states can't do this alone. And so mm -hmm. Darnell, how do you reach up to the state to get what you need? And then Elizabeth, how are you mm -hmm. reaching in the mm -hmm. local community so that local mm -hmm. leaders like um, Mayor Bird McPherson can do her mm -hmm. job at the local level? Yeah. Well, I mean, great question, and I think you're exactly right. We, we want to come out of this with more champions, more people knowledgeable about the work of early childhood prenatal to five and all the various systems, programs, services that, that support that. So we've, you know, we've used our calls with providers to bring in guest speakers from our Workforce Solutions, which is the organization that handles all the unemployment, uh, making sure that they're aware of the needs. You know, lots of questions from our early childhood providers about, like, how do I keep staff when you're paying them more to be unemployed? And, uh, but they're, they're through those conversations and through that building of relationships, you know, we're, we're built, people are becoming more, more aware and knowledgeable. I would say the other is um, our health. Uh, with this massive surveillance testing that we're doing in early childhood, our regional public health offices have been, you know, just our best best friends and our best partners as we work individually with every place where there is a positive case, doing a rapid response, handling that. But again, it's using those opportunities to learn more about each other's work and how they work and where we can help support them and similarly how they can help support us. So we've co-developed um, materials. I think most states have done this with their public health offices, you know, taking what the CDC has given us, but developed more localized and more state specific. I think a lot more can be done and I'd love to hear from the mayor too of how to work with our local leaders. We have worked some of our county emergency managers around PPE, making sure that our, this is kind of interesting. We were, we ordered a bunch of thermometers, no touch thermometers for all of our programs to just make sure they had that. And, um, and we started talking on the call about how we needed to get it out. And people just started saying, I'll, I'll help in my area. Can I be a champion over here? And so people, so out of that, then we built a PPE network, 
connected to a local community um, emergency manage management system. So we're, we're still seeing how that's working, but again, getting people to know each other and know about the systems that are in our communities locally to help families, I think has been something that we want to take out of this and build off of because <laughs> it's locally where fam, you know, that's where families are going to get their services and their supports. Um, and so mm -hmm. the more we can understand it at the state level, we can set our infrastructure and our strategy around supporting better local, you know, just supporting our local communities. Right, right. And now, Felicia, what kind of ships? Yeah, Felicia. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I think one of the things that we um, are being very intentional about um, as a team is um, learning each other's work, right? So we knew a couple years ago that we were all in very similar spaces. We had a goal of serving birth to eight, prenatal to eight, and in, um, in the vulnerable communities. And coming together under one team, we're actually caring how not only does our work, work intersect and we're often serving the same families and communities, but there's a lot of learning that, you know, and, and information that we just didn't have to do really good informed choices when it comes to partnering and grant making. And, um, you know, just how, um, important it is for us to understand the, the health, you know, immunization of young children. I know we talk about it in early child care, but this has just elevated a lot of the partnerships with our maternal child health work, right? Really understanding the, you know, where mothers are, how mothers are um, served, and mm -hmm. um, not only when they're pregnant, but right after care. Right, where most of those children at six weeks transition into early childhood. And what are those initial relationships? How do we strengthen those partnerships? And then of course in the in the space of um the our economic work, we're we're now having these really uh, probably bigger discussions and, and deeper discussions around really supporting our early childhood um teachers, right? This pandemic has put them as in a place of now we we knew we always knew they were essential to the economy, right? But how is the narrative about them not only being part of the business community, but part of the essential community to ensure business thrives? And a lot of this is tied directly to our early childhood work that in previous conversations we never had, right? We never really did that. So we're intentionally partnering with many of our um, uh, employment equity grantees to really understand that partnership, build that stronger partnership, see the work, how um, it, it just interconnects to really strengthen families so that they can thrive. Because all of these pieces, are, right now it's COVID at the core, but it's always something that at the core of the families can strengthen them so that they can thrive and move forward. But how do we think about that collectively as a team? And we're definitely in that space right now. And, and of course, listening to our grantees to be better informed about um, how we do grant making moving forward. And Darnell, you already given us a couple of examples. Um, we're moving towards the closing, um, but there are three things that I think we haven't mentioned. Um, number one is um, we haven't mentioned family child care, home-based child care, and I know none of you intend to exclude that. It's a real foundation. We have not mentioned QRS um, as a um, tool for quality and care. So I don't know if anybody wants to um, lean into that. Um, but thinking about all that we've talked about, you know, what are your kind of last thoughts about messages to families or messages to state leaders um, moving forward? And there's a huge rainstorm. I have it here. Elizabeth may have it there. Yeah. So we lost her for a minute. I'm sure she'll pop back when she can. Mm -hmm. But you know, move it to home child home care. Let's be clear that we're not excluding them. Um, and exactly. reaching up to school age as well. Right. Mm -hmm. I think that that um, what this has um, elevated is how essential and important family child care workers are. <laughs> you know, really, you know sometimes second or third in many discussions and how just their their ability to respond and be flexible and serve that need, it has definitely been elevated during this time. And part of the work, which I mentioned before, is really 
providing them supports to become and understand the business of childcare and be seen as part of the business community, servicing the economic development and growth within communities. So we are um, definitely doing some innovative grant making around that. We're really partnering and learning from um, Colorado, just some really good models of family child care and how we can then strengthen that work and help them not only build quality, but keep their core components of the cultural pieces that so many families choose them for. Mm-hmm. So really doing some good work around that. Yeah, thank you. Darnell? I think that um, I agree with everything that Felicia said. I think that we need to also remember that we have to reach out to non-traditional partners. We have to find other groups, other entities, and engage them so that they can help us, help the families, help the child care providers, um, holding people more accountable. Um, every, every entity has some impact on the lives of children. Mm-hmm. And so every entity should have some, provide some sort of support, should be at the table. And we should not be afraid to ask, reach out to them, whether it's the community, uh, the community reinvestment money that the banks have. We just need to find, reach out to those non-traditional partners and make some uh, serious uh, efforts towards mobilizing people and helping them to be aware of their power. Um, when you talk about the child care providers and the amount of uh, impact that they have within a family and the fact that they are, they're the ones that are there that you can stay late come early their homes are always open emergency situations are there so we have to find a way really to undergird and support them in a more significant way yeah thank you and elizabeth we're doing kind of the wrap up um message to to communities or messages to your state colleagues um and you know holding a space for qis if you have something to say about that as a tool or for home-based providers, which we haven't specifically mentioned. Okay, thank you. Yes, I lost my internet connection, so I got back in. <laughs> um, you know, I think that our message for everybody, and I want to pick up on what the mayor was saying about just the relationships with families, that that's something that we we saw early on, like all of us. Um, we had a Dr. Alicia Lieberman from the um, Child Trauma Impact Center join us in early April for one of our calls. And I think, you know, we we all talk about toxic stress and traumatic stress. And, you know, she was highlighting, like, we're all experiencing traumatic stress right now. So we we know that many of our communities are experiencing it in very profound ways all the time. And then this is on top of it. But to really just how do we support our early childhood professionals in being able to talk with families about these very serious health issues. I mean, we're, the whole issue is, will families come back into care? Will families come back to school? And so a lot of our conversations, and we did a webinar series, actually, we built off of Dr. Lieberman, and then had a series for families and for early childhood educators, just talking about the social emotional um, aspect of this pandemic on our relationships with each other, on our relationships with our children. And I think that's something that we all need to continue to be very focused on of how, how are we, because this is so new for all of us and we're, we're all grappling with it on a daily basis, how do we pay attention to, how do we talk about it? Um, Felicia shared a funny story about her son the other day when we were talking of, you know, that person's not wearing a mask, they're giving us COVID or, you know, but these are like really things that are, you know, these are impacting our, our, our well-being. And so now with our providers are saying, families don't want to have their children wear masks and are, will you tell us we have to have them wear masks? And I said, you know, this is about the relationship. You have to understand why don't they want their children to wear masks, but this is something the governor's saying we have to do in our state. So when they leave your child care program, they're going to be asked to do it. So, you know, I think w- the more we can do around building our resources and our capacity around supporting the social emotional um, conversation and the concerns families and early childhood professionals are having, uh, are, it is going to be time well spent um, and and essential to really come through this as whole spiritually, physically, mentally, and emotionally well. Great transition. And we started with the spiritual with Giovanna. And thank you so much for bringing her and centering us 
um, in this conversation. Thank all of you for your thoughts. Um, some high level themes, you know, one is everybody talked about the relationship. You ended with the relationship and social and emotional well-being. And if you don't want to wear a mask, why? You'd have to go with understanding. Um, so relationships are key. Humanize the data. Stop looking at it as a number. Um, uh, Mayor knows that one of my key practices is beneficiary voice and really going out and listening to people, not with the intention of acting immediately, but just listen for a minute and that they're not one-time opportunities, but you have to go back because it is a relationship. And then you move away from that need to feel like you have to answer everything at one time. Um, being flexible, looking at your forms, if a foundation can do it and back down and you can do it at the state. How do we keep that flexibility? Because as you said, Mayor, our families know what they need and how do we have enough relationships to give them what they need and often they can take care of something else and that this work is really a multi-lane highway um, and so we heard lots of examples from lots of different places and because we didn't mention youth or because we didn't mention any particular sector it's not that it's not important it's all important because the answers come in from families and they're going to tell us what's important at that moment and at that time but that we really do need to trust and listen um, to each and every individual, each and every family um, in ways that empower us to act. Um, and you heard some early actions, but I hope that you take from this that action is possible. Now, on our last survey, about 48% of people didn't think that the new relationship, 6% said new relationships have been built, but they were worried that 48% don't think those relationships or aren't sure those relationships are going to be sustained. And I really encourage you to ask Bill um, and others to help you in that work because it is through our interpersonal relationships with each other, whether we're doing it for work or for program or for understanding and through our action at the institutional level, which requires us to share some risk. If we're gonna be cutting budgets, we have to be thinking about our shared commitment and our shared risk and responsibility and really leaning into that. And that's better done in partnership than it is done individually. So I thank you for all the chatting. I thank you for all the questions. Sorry we couldn't get to it all. Um, I thank each of you. Um, be safe, stay safe, and please keep acting on behalf of those communities, which our systems have marginalized. Um, I like your frame, um, Felicia, as well. We created these as places of risk. And so that same energy for creation can be used to undo. And so thank you all for um, being with us today.